my name is Robert Booth, and I'm speaking to you from Philadelphia in the United States. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to address your Congress, and also particularly to Ashok Rajapal, whom I greatly respect and from whom I have learned a great deal. I have been um, I have been uh, operating and doing total knees for almost 50 years, and I'm approaching 50,000 in number. Uh, I have been accused of uh, psychosclerosis or hardening of the attitudes, and indeed my <laughs> perspective is historical. I am one of the perhaps only living surgeons who has operated with the original giants of joint surgery, John Charnley, uh, Maurice Mueller, and of course, John Insull. So I'd like to rephrase Ashok's title for me and ask whether not the man or the machine, but the archer or the arrow is the issue. If the arrow represents the prosthetic components, we are uh, almost at an asymptote, I think, in design and materials and changes. And that part leaves little opportunity for improvement. Some changes have occurred, such as uh, making asymmetrical tibial trays, which eliminated the number one error in knee replacement, which was internal rotation. But not much else is left to do with the parts. The total knee has been an enormous success and one of the greatest inventions of mankind. It is also now a global uh, device, which is put in by the millions around the world. The uh, the ingenuity for this came largely from the English and the Europeans. Uh, the Americans and the Germans are responsible, I think, for many of the technologic advances and their production of the devices. And a lot of the experience and the uh, application of this in reality has come from your enormous population in India and Asia in the laboratory of life. If you think, on the other hand, that the archer is the most important issue, then be aware that there is an enormous range of ability and dexterity and three-dimensional vision among surgeons. And the goal, of course, is to find some way to narrow the gap between a regular carpenter and John Insels of this world. You can't make any instrument that a surgeon can't use to make a mistake. These are some of the knees I've seen over the years uh, with, uh, as you can see on the top right, a little reverse slope uh, in the middle, uh, every augment in the OR stack to try and achieve balance. The tibia put in 180 degrees backwards. The patellar buttons, for some reason, seems to be a problem. Here on the bottom left is one that's even on the wrong side of the patella. And one of my favorites is, of course, a hip surgeon who confronted with a valgus knee did what he did best and put in an endoprosthesis. <laughs> we can make anything work badly. And many people just simply don't have the ability to do things with simple instruments. Uh, this computer sat in one of the ORs in my hospital, largely unused, and uh, I didn't realize the sign didn't mean don't touch, it meant that it was for people with bad hands. If you like a statistical evidence, just remember that 49% of orthopedists are below average and always will be. So it's neither of the first two. I think the real issue is the bow, is the instrument that interfaces between the archer and the arrow. Our original instruments were soft tissue balancing and shorted alignment. We then went to Dunn-Burton instruments, which use intramedullary alignment at the expense of soft tissue balancing. And one of the hopes of robots and computers was that they would balance the two. Bony alignment plus soft tissue input at every decision point would be the ideal for any instrument. And indeed, there have been instruments such as the VSTAT, which had a short life, but combined both those principles of tensioning and uh, intramedullary alignment. But the goal of instruments is to make things simpler not to make them more complicated, which seems to be the trend today. Um, the instruments we have are getting more and more complex rather than less, and I am not sure they're the help they should be. 
Now, I'm not trying to pose as a Luddite uh, like this gentleman from the uh, 19th century in Britain whose followers destroyed new inventions so that they wouldn't lose their job in the Industrial Revolution. In fact, 30 years ago this year, I got the Nice Society Prize for creating a balancing device to be implanted as a trial in the knee using a film and a computer. This was unfortunately not popular clinically because nobody wanted to deal with a computer 30 years ago, including myself. We're also using uh, at the smart knee now, PIQ from Zimmer, which has within it a device to allow us to monitor the patient's ride and balance and motion. This I think is an advance. The question for you all is whether or not to use robotics uh, in your own practice. Uh, the putative value of robotics was that it would shorten the distance between the Gaussian distributions of Ur. So you hear, see in Sparman's article that he indeed had uh, fewer outriders, but of course his range of Ur without an outrider was 13 degrees. Clearly that's too wide a range for anybody. And the promise was that if you got the alignment better and reduced the outriders, you would get more rapid recovery, uh, better outcomes, etc. The difficulty is that there's a disconnect, and this has not been the case, that outriders are not, um, uh, uh, even though they are reduced, the uh, connection between perfect alignment has not been shown to improve clinical function long term. I personally prefer the mechanical axis, but be aware there are three axes that people can choose, and the kinematic design that's come about recently, I think is yet another mistake, as putting knees in varus requires that you either leave the medial side lateral or that you internally rotate the component. This was the problem with the PCA knee of Hungerford and Krakow. So you have in your alignment armamentarium several options, one to use the ligaments, two to use an intermedullary device, three to use computers and navigation, or lastly to choose robotics. I used to visit John Insel quite frequently and one of his commandments was not to believe knees in varus. I think that still applies. But it's not all about the bone. That's one of the problems is that we focus exclusively on bone. The uh, ideal would be to have at every step a bony and a soft tissue option to create alignment and balance simultaneously. The key issue is balance. That's the thing that determines a great knee from an average knee. And uh, balance trumps actual alignment. The problem is it's hard to quantify because we don't have strain gauges in our instruments. Tension is not the same as pressure or displacement and we have very variable ligamentous laxity in our patient population, such as the women with rear bottom. In a soft tissue bearing uh, uh, mode, in a cam type joint, the joint should be snug in flexion and loose in extension. But because we have shifted our strategy to doing extension first and then flexion, we are now producing a, a generation of knees with flexion and stability uh, and I think that sequence has, needs to go back to the way it originally was. I personally would rather have a knee that's totally well balanced, but three degrees out of alignment, than a knee that's perfectly aligned, but has three millimeters of laxity. So is there something out there to help us? Is there some uh, instrument that will create that soft tissue balancing that's so critical? Well, there are many devices out there on the market these days, and many of you have seen all. Uh, some claim to create a balance, but without a strain gauge, they are not, they're measuring displacement and pressure and not truly tension. There are places where robots, I think, are very helpful, such as spots that are difficult to reach, like a prostate, or spots that are dangerous to reach, like a pedicle with a screw implantation. But a total knee is a subcutaneous uh, operation, and there's not a great deal of danger or difficulty with access. So really this is not a penicillin moment for total knees to create a robot. 
The literature is very interesting. It's very soft and uh, inconclusive, but largely even great studies like this with a 13-year follow-up, but a great number of patients show no difference between robotic and, and conventional instrument knees. Note the 2% infection rate as well. We need to be aware that these the instruments, uh, robotics in particular, take longer and, flex, and infection and uh, DVT are linearly related to the length of the surgery. Uh, 50 years ago, the little robot in the center, I would argue, could do everything that our current robots do today. And our tools are getting more complex unnecessarily. I don't think that a mallet is a particularly difficult instrument to use. But there are now mallets that are pneumatic. One company's leaks, the other looks like a machine gun. And I think this is over technology in knee replacement. So what are the rules? If you have a new idea or a new device, one should wait at least two years until it appears in a peer-reviewed journal by a non-designer. If you follow those three simple uh, filters, you would avoid all the complications we've seen recently. There is little difference in clinical outcome for any of the robotic or conventional technology, as you see in this article from some years ago. At the recent Knee Society interim meeting, a surgeon I respect enormously, Faris Haddad, presented a series of patients done with robotic and conventional instruments. And the only difference that came from all of that was that the patients with the robotic knee had less awareness of their knee, whatever that means. No difference at all in complications or need for manipulations or outcomes. He also and the discussion talked of a sham robotic uh, pers uh, test that he did, actually putting in pins, doing the same OR setup, using the same protocols, uh, but not using the robot, and showing that there was no difference between that and the knees in which the robot was used. So just the magic of the name robot is not enough to improve the results. We can reduce our outliers, but I think that makes weak surgeons <laughs> average. It also may make great surgeons average. And one of the other interesting articles that uh, came from that Knee Society meeting was the residency training perception, where 222 residents surveyed about their robotic uh, joint uh, education felt that 70% uh, had received the training, 50% of the knees they did were robotic, but 29 felt, only 29% felt robotics improved their result. 53% felt that it was done largely for marketing. And 25% felt that the uh, constrained knees they did, did were worse. Uh, most felt their teachers had a fiscal interest, and that's why they were being taught robotics to begin with. So the real value may well be the marketing. And certainly, there's, every little hospital in our area has a marketing sign, and it does attract patients. We also have podiatrists who will cut your toenails and do a pedicure with a laser. I think these are equivalent arguments. It's far better in my mind to under-promise but over-deliver than the opposite. And if you think that putting a, a computer or a CD or a robot into your OR is going to make your life better, I think you're naive. I think a robot in the OR, it, to me, is like the electronic medical record in the clinic. Enormous frustrating and not particularly helpful. It also requires that you have someone who knows how to manage these devices. And so the uh, people who may have a very different view of the world may be the most important person in the OR, not the surgeon. So to make a difference, a difference has to be has to make a difference or it doesn't make a difference. And it would appear that there's not much difference with robots. The economics are, need to be considered. The robots cost a million dollars a piece. They're not reimbursed by the insurers, at least in America. You need an IT person available to help work it, and they're not even endorsed by the academy. So the return on investment is really measured in patients, not in outcomes. So, so far, there's no significant difference, at least from what I can perceive. You need to ask yourself, how much help do you need and can you afford it? 
Some, like me, are too comfortable to change. Some, like change, seek their comfort. And there's no question that the world of robotics and artificial intelligence will create magical new devices in the future. But I think the next great leap is not going to be robotic, but biologic. I think that either stem cell technology or cloning or some other new concept will create a far better need than continuing to put metal and plastic in. If there is ever a, a Nobel Prize for total knee replacement, I think it will go to somebody who has a biologic answer and not a prosthetic answer. Thank you. Thank you.